everybody. We're live this Friday afternoon from Boulder, Colorado, uh, live here with you. And I'm here to answer your questions. It's one of my favorite times of the month. Um, and I've already got a few questions that came in beforehand from patients and other um, fans. And I'm going to just get the screen here um, so that I can see your feed. So if you just give me a moment. Um, interestingly enough, I have a funny story. Uh, we've had wildfires starting already. It's so dry. There's a drought here in Colorado. Um, so we desperately need the rain and it's supposed to rain this weekend, which is wonderful. So I was at the coffee shop earlier, which is where I love to write and work and do things. And um, I got caught in the biggest downpour. I don't remember ever being in such a downpour. Um, and of course I had to get back home for an interview and uh, also for this live Q and A. So I walked out and if I look a little bit like a drowned rat, I got completely soaked, hailed on. And then I drove home at 10 miles an hour with windshield wipers going, but I was so grateful for the um, rain because we desperately need it. So that's where I just came from. It was quite an adventure getting home to this Q and A, um, but it was it was fun, and I'm so glad for the rain. Okay, so I'm just getting to the place where I can see your questions and answers and things um, pop in and tell me where you're from if you're listening. I would love to see. I'll say hello as I see you guys in the feed, and uh, like I said, I've got some question and answers to start with. Um, one of my patients had asked a question about leaky gut. So I think that's a great place to start today. And um, gosh, first of all, how many of you out there have been told you have leaky gut or have symptoms of leaky gut? Let's talk just a little bit about what is leaky gut? What does this mean? Is it real? How do you heal it? Hey, Taylor. Hey, Jennifer. Hey, Michelle. Awesome. Start to Amanda. Um, Oh my gosh. Hello, everybody. It's so great to start to see your Hi, Jeannie um, from Iowa and awesome. Hey, Marsha from Ohio. Hey, Tony from Boston, Mandy from Ontario. Um, awesome to see all you guys on today. Um, so leaky gut. So basically what happens is this, we have these enterocytes um, that line the gut. These are the cells um, that line the gut and they are about one cell layer thick. They're like tiles on your bathroom wall. And in between those tiles, just like if it was on your bathroom wall, there's grout. The grout is the tight junctions that keep things that should stay in the gut lumen in the gut lumen and keep it out of the immune system. Because between this, so we have gut lumen that lines, you know, the, where the food goes from your mouth down to your bottom. And uh, then you have this one cell layer that is between the gut lumen and the bloodstream. And that one cell layer is, is uh, thin because you need to diffuse nutrients and um, get nutrition through that cell layer. So really, really important. However, um, if there is toxic exposure like mold, um, chemicals um, in your environment, phthalates, parabens, BPA, et cetera, in your food supply, um, if there's gluten and you're sensitive to gluten, whether it's celiac or non-celiac gluten sensitivity, or even if you're just a healthy, regular person, um, all people have some degree of increased permeability after a meal containing gluten, because gluten happens to be a trigger to the little trap door that opens and closes the cellular junctions called zonulin. So that's one reason why you've probably heard me talk about before. If you have autoimmunity or immune inflammation or leaky gut, generally in my clinic, at least I will take you off gluten temporarily, sometimes permanently, even if you don't have celiac disease, because it decreases that inflammatory load on the immune system. So the intestinal permeability is in the medical literature. That's a more technical term for leaky gut. In the lay terms, we call it leaky gut because it kind of describes what's happening. But what happens here, and again, it's super prevalent because of our toxic load and the things that are harming our endothelial cells, all of a sudden when we eat a meal, um, it's called postprandial or after we eat, we have this leakage of food contents like corn antigen or peanut antigen or whatever we're eating. And those antigens of the food may be partially digested, will go through between the cells where the tight junctions aren't doing their job and there's hyperpermeability and they'll leak right into the immune system, which is the blood um, and how we diffuse nutrients. So what happens in that immune system is we have Pac-Man that are called HLA dendritic cells. This is part of our immune system that's always sampling. So that HLA system is basically trying to protect us from things like parasites or bacteria in our food or salmonella or viruses, which even like COVID can act in the gut. Um, so what happens is if we get exposure to some infection, um, our body will react appropriately and try to create antibodies to that virus or bacteria or parasite. 
But unfortunately, what can happen is if there's incredible increased permeability or leaky gut because of immune inflammation, mold exposure, toxic exposure, poor diet, stress, et cetera, um, those tight junctions become less tight, food leaks in, um, immune system gets ir irritable or irritated. I always think of it like poking a bear. And so this immune system then starts to overreact to the antigens from food, which they're just food, they're not bad guys, but this can start an inflammatory cascade. And we can see this manifest all over the body because as the immune system starts to overreact and create antibodies to these food antigens that are coming through between like where the grout should be between our cells, um, then this creates a more inflammatory load on the immune system, more cytokines are produced and the cytokine inflammation is what can cause systemic symptoms like brain fog or fatigue or joint pain or autoimmunity like thyroiditis or rheumatoid arthritis or multiple sclerosis or any number of things that are inflammatory in nature. And often this gut immune interface where I'm talking about where leaky gut happens, this is where the start of autoimmunity um, manifest because this is our interface with the world. That gut lumen is our way to interface with the outside world. So hopefully that explains a little bit about what is leaky gut, why it's so much more prevalent and why eating a low antigenic diet, which would be like an elimination diet, the common foods that I have people eliminate, sugar, dairy, gluten are the top three. If I have to pick just one, it's gluten. If I have to pick three, it's gluten, dairy, sugar. And then there's some more common diets that are more like seven or eight antigens. They're called elimination diets. Um, Whole30 has been a way that's popularized these elimination diets. And typically those will eliminate um, dairy, egg, gluten, corn, soy, sugar, alcohol, sometimes peanut, because those tend to be the top inflammatory foods. So if you're out there, you think you might have leaky gut, you've been dealing with leaky gut, you probably are already on somewhat a restricted diet, but it, it can be very important in the healing process to take out those antigenic foods temporarily while you heal. So that's just a little background on leaky gut. And the patient's question that I had asked about this is how do you know when you're healed? How do you know when you no longer have leaky gut? Well, let me tell you from experience. Um, I, 20 years ago now, was diagnosed with breast cancer, totally overcame that. But through that breast cancer experience, I had chemotherapeutic drugs to treat the cancer, three drugs for six weeks, six cycles. And one of those chemotherapeutic drugs was particularly hard on the gut. It was called cytoxin. And that drug created a, a more permeable gut. And then six months after I was finished with chemo, finished with cancer, I got diagnosed with Crohn's disease. Now, what's interesting about that is I didn't know it, but I also had silent or latent celiac disease where I was creating an inflammatory response to gluten and damaging the um, villi of the gut that line the gut to create an absorptive surface. So those villi were becoming damaged and I didn't even know it and gluten was contributing to that. So unbeknownst to me, I had celiac that was undiagnosed and then I had these chemotherapeutic agents and pretty heavy duty toxic therapy that created more permeability. And then I also had a genetic predisposition called NOD2. And that makes me more prone to Crohn's and colitis, basically an abnormal immune response to normal microbiome. So this was the perfect storm for me to be diagnosed um, several months after the cancer was done with treatment um, with Crohn's disease. So what happened was I had to dive in and figure out how to treat my Crohn's disease. I'm completely free of it now. A lot of people don't believe it. They're like, well, you must be in remission. I'm not only in remission, I am cured. I don't have any sort of signs and symptoms for the last probably 16 or 17 years of Crohn's disease. Now, I just tell you that story to give you a framework because all of that is um, a way to understand the gut immune interface and understanding how I treated the Crohn's disease and how I healed my own gut is part of this healing leaky gut because I was the perfect poster child. I was like a guinea pig and I had to figure it out for myself. So I did take out those antigenic foods and I've actually remained on a low antigenic diet. I'm grain-free, egg-free, dairy-free, gluten-free. Um, I do a fairly low histamine diet. I don't eat a lot of tomato, potato, some of the nightshades. Um, but what happens is when I eat very clean like that with a low antigenic diet, I don't have any symptoms of gut dysfunction and my Crohn's is gone. So often when you're trying to heal your own leaky gut, taking out those foods is a first step. And then the second steps that you want to do it are looking at the microbiome. 
So this is where a great functional medicine doctor can help you because they can look at organic acid testing or stool testing or um, small bowel intestinal overgrowth, bacterial overgrowth, like a breath test, a lactulous test, where they will see if there is um, manifestation of hydrogen or methane in your breath because of overgrowth of bacteria in your gut. Um, they, a doctor can also do testing for yeast overgrowth. They can do blood work for antibodies. They can do organic acids, which are markers in the urine that show yeast, or they could do stool testing. And any of those three that are positive could indicate a yeast overgrowth as well. So we have not only bacterial overgrowth, we have fungal overgrowth. Some people have parasites. I see this a lot if you've traveled to foreign countries, if you've had food poisoning, um, if you eat a lot of raw foods or you go camping, hiking, swimming in streams or you know mountain lakes or things where there could be giardia or cryptosporidia or some of these other bugs that live in freshwater places. So all of those things can contribute to leaky gut. And when I'm looking at a person with leaky gut, which is very common, what I first want to do is go to find if there's any infection or overgrowth or bacteria or fungus, because I'm not going to be able to heal that leaky gut until I go deeper and try to find the root cause. And the root cause is often related to an infection or a toxin or an overgrowth of bacteria or yeast. So that's where you start. Once you get that overgrowth of bacteria or yeast taken care of, then you can start using things like glutamine, bovine immune globulins, zinc carnosine, um, nutrients like vitamin A and vitamin D. Um, all those are critical. Essential fatty acids, um, sometimes gamma linoleic acid, all of these things are critical to start to heal the gut. And then there's probiotics. Probiotics, there's a whole bunch of them out there. Um, there's lots of um, evidence on spore probiotics. I'm especially fond of them. Things like Bacillus subtilis, Bacillus coagulans, and then combination products. Megaspore is one of my favorites, but all of these products can be really, really helpful. And especially when used in conjunction with colostrum or bovine immune globulins or glutamine powder or aloe or zinc carnosine. And then the patient's question, which I asked a few minutes ago, how do you know when the leaky gut is healed? Well, one of the things that people come in with is this, where they keep reacting to more and more foods. And you've probably seen this, or maybe you're experiencing this, where your box of foods that you can eat just keeps getting smaller. Anyone out there raising your hand, you can sure comment if you want, but um, a lot of people feel like they have less and less ability to eat foods and they're getting more and more restrictions. That, my dear, is a leaky gut. That's part of that. And it's also toxic load. So your toxic environmental load, which could be contributing to leaky gut, all of this is creating a fact that your immune system is more reactive and you're less able to eat freely. Um, I never like to keep patients there. I don't like to make their box smaller. Now, once in a while, temporarily, um, we will take out some antigenic foods or we'll test them. And if you've done with your doctor a test for IgG food sensitivities, those are systemic antibodies. And what happens is you really shouldn't be creating systemic antibodies to food. So what that means is you've got some degree of permeability happening if your IgG, thanks for the raised hand, Amanda. I know you guys out there understand this. Um, so basically when you have permeability, those IgGs to food start to develop because of the thing I described earlier, which is this transfer between the cells of food antigens. And then those IgGs you can measure in the blood. So if I do a food antigen profile, um, like 96 or 144 or 200 foods, and I see them light up like a Christmas tree where there's tons and tons of food allergies, that's pretty much a guarantee that there's intestinal permeability. Now it's important because sometimes you see those food antibody tests and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm allergic to everything. There's like four foods I can eat. Raise your hand again, you know, metaphorically or um, uh, virtually because uh, you probably have been there or know someone who has where you have all these food allergies. Um, the issue there is not that you wanna eliminate all those foods. Some of the big ones, yes, like the top seven that I mentioned earlier, dairy, egg, gluten, soy, corn, sugar, alcohol, peanut, However, what this means is there's intestinal permeability. And because there's like these gut, these cells are so leaky that you're getting antigens in there and you continue to react to those foods. The problem is not, the solution is not just taking out more and more foods. The solution is actually getting to the root cause, getting to the toxic load, the mold exposure, the chronic infection, the overgrowth of bacteria, the overgrowth of yeast, the parasites, the low stomach acid, the low pancreatic enzymes, any of these things, the low short chain fatty acids, any of these things can contribute to that permeability. So you really have to go to the root. 
Um, now, like I said, back to the patient's question was, how long does it take to heal or how do I know when I'm healed? This is tricky because like for me, I'm 20 years out, I'm completely healed from Crohn's. I will probably always have more permeability than someone who's never been through what I've been through. So for example, I still eat a fairly restricted diet. Now it's much, much less restricted than it was 10 or 20 years ago, but I still choose to eat a very clean, low antigenic diet because I feel better. And then I still choose to take vitamin A and vitamin D, sometimes glutamine, lots of other nutrients for the gut, um, because I want to continue to restore that. So those of you who have had leaky gut, you might always be prone to some degree of permeability and you can push the boundaries, but you might find like me, if I drink too much alcohol, which I pretty much don't drink at all, um, or if I eat the wrong foods, I could still have symptoms at times. Um, and so it's, it's important to find that balance. Um, but how would you know is when you can have more variety in your diet and you have no symptoms, you have no dysbiosis, your digestion is good. You have normal form stools and, um, you feel great, good energy, no brain fog. That'd be the, the ultimate end goal. Okay. That was a lot on leaky gut, but I think it's so important. I hope that was helpful for all of you. Um, I'm going to go through and look at questions now and see what you guys are wanting to know. Hi from Vancouver. Um, hello everybody. If I didn't say hello to Asheville. Hi, Adam, um, Joseph from New Jersey. Hello. Hello. Uh, so forgive me if I'm missing any of you. It's awesome to have you here and listening. Um, and I'm just going to kind of randomly pick out a few questions. Um, what can a person do to help after um, vaccine? So um, I feel like I'm pretty neutral on this, but there definitely, whether it's the spike proteins from COVID itself in the long haul or spike proteins from the vaccination, they can be inflammatory triggers temporarily. Um, and what I'm recommending at this point is um, calming the cytokines through things like Boswellia, uh, Chinese skull cap, B propolis, um, N acetylcysteine, uh, quercetin, uh, vitamin C, all of these things can be really supportive for the immune system. So that's a good way to support your immune system after you've been vaccinated. Uh, Tony says, piggybacking on previous interview about immune resilience, mold, Lyme, et cetera, bigger issues now from modern day toxicity. So Tony's referring to, I just did, if you didn't see it, I did a great interview with Dr. Eric Lund Lundquist and um, it's really great. You can go back and watch that. It was just the hour before this such an expert and brought so many good points there. And we were talking about how there's more prevalence of immune dysfunction and chronic infection and things because of the toxic load. So Tony's question is, is this turning out to be true with COVID long haulers? Um, yes, 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 yes. And that's why like for those of us who've done functional medicine and kind of chronic infections and toxins, the long haul stuff is no surprise. Not at all, because we've been doing this for CMV, which is cytomegaly virus, Epstein-Barr, uh, Coxsackie viruses, all of these other viruses can cause uh, basically what you could call a long haul symptom where they reactivate or cause immune dysfunction. It's not really new. Now, COVID is a novel new virus, so we're seeing more of it related to this, but the, the mechanisms of what's happening um, from toxic load, weakened immune system and chronic activation of the immune system is not really a new concept. And so we kind of know already how to treat this. There are things that are antiviral that can be helpful. Um, there's uh, anti-inflammatory things, like I said, things that decrease cytokine. Um, so Boswellia, curcumin, um, quercetin, uh, B propolis, Chinese skull cap, and many, many others. These are all really helpful at calming the immune response. One particular product I love is um, our, it's called Cytoblocks. I'll be sure and I'll link that there. It's an amazing combination of Chinese skull cap, B propolis, and turmeric. So I'm going to find that and link that up for you right now um, because I've really been recommending that a lot for inflammation that people are um, suffering from because it's got a great combination. Um, the Chinese skull cap in particular is super helpful for um, uh, mast cell. So the mast cell activation. And so I'm always recommending that. And if you see me looking around, I'm trying to find the link for you here. So, so I can put that in there. Okay. Any, uh, Mandy just asked about sugars. Um, so I think I'd mentioned in the elimination diet, cane sugar is particularly inflammatory. If you do need to substitute, I'm a huge fan of organic natural stevia. It's a plant that can actually be antimicrobial to um, dysbiosis or even for Lyme. Um, monk fruit, coconut palm sugar, um, and some of these uh, alternatives are a little bit lower glycemic and lower inflammation. So if I do use even natural um, honey that's local from wildflowers can be helpful as well. Just use it in moderation because any sort of sugar is going to feed if you have yeast overgrowth or certain types of bacteria. 
Um, and Taub, yes, we have so much crap today. You're right. Um, our food supply is so contaminated. So a lot of the food has additives and things. And those things actually do glyphosate, for example, which is Roundup. Um, when it's sprayed on foods and gets into our gut, it actually affects not only our microbiome, it preferentially kills lactobacillus, which is one of our good probiotics and causes things like clostridia, which is a problem if it overgrows to proliferate. So it can really disturb the balance of the microbiome and it can chelate minerals in the gut, which are critical for our own function and for the function of the microbiome. So any sort of food that's non-organic and sprayed with glyphosate can affect our gut very uh, detrimentally. Hi, Jeannie. Hi, mycophenolic acid showing up. Oh gosh. So mycophenolic is a, a mycotoxin and is particularly harmful for the immune system. So this one in particular, when I see it, it can be associated with aspergillus or penicillin or some of the other molds. Um, but the bigger issue is mycophenolic acid is used in cell sept and some of the immunosuppressive drugs. And so it's used to actually create immune suppressive drugs. So it does suppress the immune system. So patients who are colonized with mycophenolic acid often have a little suppression of immune system. They might have more infections or viral load, or they might have more yeast infections as well. So thanks for asking that, Jeannie. Um, as far as what to take for that, I would recommend basic uh, clay charcoal. I'm a huge fan of GI detox. I'll include a link to that as well. Um, and also just plain old charcoal. Um, those are all super helpful. Um, there's a bind aid that we have that's a glycomannan, and that's a really nice gentle one if you're um, sensitive to binders. It's called bind aid. Like I said, I'm gonna actually um, link that up right now if I can find it easily for you. Um, so the GI detox, the charcoal, the bind aid, all of these guys are really good. And I always like using a combination of binders because um, sometimes they have different affinities. So when you combine binders, if you can tolerate them, you're getting more activity for more types of mold and toxins. So those are super helpful. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Tony, Mandy, sugars, we talked about. Um, Jeannie, we talked about that. Um, day in the life of Jill's diet. <laughs> I always find these questions funny because I'm like, ah, you know, I do my thing personally for me and um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing for you. Um, but I will tell you my day in the life of my diet. And what's funny is the difficulty is if you're someone who likes variety, I just talked to a friend who's like, has to have a new food every single day, every single meal. I'm like, well, I probably couldn't survive because I do tend to eat some of the same stuff because I am somewhat restricted. Now, first thing is so important. I have really learned to accept this. Like, I love the diet. I love the foods that I can eat. I don't miss anything. I mean, granted cheesecake, that was really good. Pizza, that was really good, but it's not like I'm routinely craving or missing those foods. So it's kind of nice if you can get to the point where you accept what your limitations are for the time being and learn to enjoy those foods. Um, and I really feel like the things that I don't eat, I don't really miss. I really love the foods that I eat. So fruits and vegetables, pretty much all fruits and vegetables. I love and I'm not super restricted unless it's a high histamine. Um, I don't do tomatoes. I don't do potatoes, white potatoes. I actually don't do a lot of sweet potatoes or starchy vegetables either. I do a more low starch diet, but breakfast is typically like a grain free cereal. Um, some of the great brands out there are Lark, Ellen Farms, Purely Elizabeth, which is a local boulder company, and there's many more. Um, but I love nuts and seeds, a kind of a rich, high calorie. Um, I'll often use a coconut, an organic coconut fermented yogurt. Now, if your histamine issue, Issues. Sometimes those um, yogurts can be a little bit tricky. I have found no problem with Colina, um, so delicious brand. Um, there is a Koyo. There's a bunch of great brands out there. I have no affiliation with these brands, but I know a lot of you are like, where do I get this? What do I eat? So I'm trying to tell you specific brands for that purpose. Um, I love unsweetened coconut milk on there too. So what I'll do is I'll do a, a grain-free granola, pour on some fresh organic berries, and then add a little scoop of coconut yogurt, um, and then add unsweetened coconut milk. That's usually my breakfast. An alternative to that would be a smoothie with lots of leafy greens, maybe coconut milk. I often add a scoop of collagen powder. Our, um, it's called Collagen Boost that we have in our retail store. Love this. It's got three patented brands of collagen. Super helpful for hair, skin, and nails. 
And and I always get comments. Thank you on my skin. Um, Part of it, I think, is I use collagen every single day. I'm going to share the product that I like. It's called Collagen Boost, but you can use any good collagen product as well. But I actually put a scoop of that in my grain-free granola. So every morning I have that. I also, I don't drink near as much coffee as I used to. I think coffee can be very good antioxidant if it's clean and um, good quality. My favorite brand is Purity. So that's a really good tested for mycotoxins and pesticides and all of that. Bulletproof is another great brand. And often if I do drink a cup of coffee, I will put a collagen creamer from Vital Proteins in there. So delicious. You can make your own latte. My recipe for that is um, stevia, organic stevia, one scoop of Vital Proteins collagen creamer, which I'm going to link up here in just a second. And then um, a little bit of cinnamon, love cinnamon in my coffee. So the coffee, the breakfast, um, the alternative breakfast, like I said, would be leafy greens, all kinds of varieties there, maybe a little coconut or almond milk, collagen powder. You could put fresh turmeric, fresh ginger in there. Um, Parsley is really good for detox. If you like cilantro and it doesn't overpower it with that soapy taste. Um, And then uh, I often will add chia, flax, or hemp for some fiber um, and usually some frozen berries like blueberries, strawberries, raspberries, or a combination. Uh, If you want a little sweetener, I will add stevia and that makes a great breakfast or snack. Lunches and dinners are typically leafy greens and uh, sometimes a little chicken or fish. Sometimes I just do nuts and seeds. I don't always have meat with that. Um, And then other things would be like roasted um, vegetables are some of my favorite with either uh, coconut oil or olive oil, or you can do, um, you know, baked chicken. Uh, I love wild salmon. I love trout, some of the smaller white fish, low mercury for sure. Um, If you're doing salmon, I would recommend you do wild coho, sockeye, or king. And do not touch the farm salmon. It's one of the most toxic foods on the planet. Um, So that's where I I go with foods. That's kind of it in a nutshell. Okay, let's go back to your questions here. Um, Mary Kay recently saw some information on endocrine disruption from stevia. Um, So I have not seen issues with stevia, but the key is this. A lot of the commercial brands contain other things. So they might be combined with Splenda or they might be combined with um, urethritol. So what I try to find is a pure stevia extract, either powdered or tincture. Mine is alcohol free um, and it is um, just pure stevia extract. So that's really part of the important thing. I have not seen endocrine disruption. And uh, Mary Kay, if you want to share anything on that, I am happy to look and comment on that because it could be something that, that's new that I don't know about yet. Um, but I have not seen any issues with endocrine disruption on pure stevia. Okay. Um, Tal, you've got a real specific question on the Nutra eval. Um, I would have to look that up because that is a very specific amino acid. I will try to come back and answer that for you. Um, but right now I don't want to go to find a neutral and find that specific amino acid. Okay. Uh, Taub asks, I missed it. What did you say for good substitute for sugar? Um, monk fruit is low glycemic and coconut palm sugar. And of course, stevia, all of those are fairly low glycemic and uh, well tolerated. Natural honey or maple syrup can also be used. And again, just use it in moderation. I'm not a fan of cane sugar. So that's the one I usually have people totally avoid. And certainly aspartame or um, Splenda sucralose are not advised at all. Um, Okay, I think I'll do another question or two and then we'll wrap up today. This is always so fun. I feel like I'm with old friends. Uh, Let's see, Michelle asked about three days after gallbladder removal, chronic inflammation and pain all over. Now only able to eat a handful of foods, a SIBO and H. pylori positive. Okay, so let's talk about gallbladder. You've got a whole bunch of symptoms there and I'm so sorry you're suffering, um, Michelle. So gallbladder is the storage container for bile. Bile is our storage for both cholesterol and toxins like mycotoxins and toxins from other things. And it also, as we excrete bile from the gallbladder into the small bowel, it helps to sterilize the bowel so that we don't get bacterial overgrowth. So it's no surprise that in your question, you said, you know, I have my gallbladder was out. Things have never been the same since. And I have SIBO and H. pyloric because there is a connection. Now, when you don't have a gallbladder, all that is, is the storage bag for your bile It doesn't mean that you don't still have bile, but the bile now without that storage facility, just drips, drip, drip, 
drip. So because of that, you're not having a bolus of bile with meals to help emulsify the fats. So you can tend to have more loose stools or trouble with your bowels or trouble with fatty foods because you don't have that bolus of bile helping to emulsify fats with your meals. Instead, you're just dripping. And between meals, that bile acid can cause uh, diarrhea or loose stools or symptoms or burning or pain. But you mentioned you have these infections and it's kind of no surprise because if the bile function isn't adequate, then you're going to be prone to overgrowth. So it's real common, even if you still have your gallbladder to have dysfunctional bile acid. So what could we do about that? Now, if you had your gallbladder removed, you want to talk to your doctor and make sure that this is safe for you and also watch for symptoms, but bitters, um, Swedish bitters or any of the bitters. I like um, Quicksilver Bitters X. I like Gaia Herbs Bitters. I like um, Better Bitters. And we have all of those on drjillhealth.com. You can take a look yourself. Um, and, and using these with meals, it can enhance secretion of bile acid. When we went to the Swiss Mountain Clinic the last couple of years before COVID, um, one of the things that was part of the liver gallbladder detox that we did for a week was taking absinthe, which is one of those original bitters with every single meal super bitter. I happen to like the bitter taste, so I don't mind it, but I literally carry a little vial of absinthe in my purse to use with meals at times. And sometimes I share it for fun with friends and it's fun to see the faces because that bitter is so bitter. You get these amazingly um, contorted faces <laughs> when you share your bitters. So it's kind of fun. So bitters. Tudka, have you heard of Tudka? Tudka is a great product to help with bile flow. So I'm a huge fan of Tudka. I'm gonna see if I can find a link for you to show you the product that I like. Um, it's also at drjillhealth.com. Um, I'm looking and I don't see it listed there, so we'll get you a link for that. But Tudka is a great product as well. So those are just some things you can do um, with your meals. Okay, I'm gonna do one more question and then we will wrap it up for today and I'll be back in next month. <clears throat> um, I have a question on intermittent fasting and diets to suppress latent viruses. Oh, we got so many good questions. Um, and thank you, Michelle, for your thanks. Um, so low IG. Okay, I think I can answer a couple of these. Um, love Tudka Taylor. That's what I just mentioned. Intermittent fasting. Okay, so intermittent fasting has so many benefits. Fasting is one of the few things that has shown reversal of mitochondrial aging. So it's probably the most strong evidence for anti-aging. So I'm a huge fan. That would be like 12 to 16 hours overnight fasting. And then, so maybe you stop eating at 7 PM and then wait till 10 or 11 AM to have your first meal. And part of why that does that is every time we eat a meal, if you heard Dr. Eric Lundquist and I talk in the hour previous, go back and check out that video because um, every time you are eating, even if you're healthy, you are increasing the low on your immune system because we have some permeability that happens after your meals. So when you fast, you basically give your immune system a break. And that's really cool. Now, the other thing we do is we can induce a decreased leptin and increased um, metabolism of glucose and um, increased usage of ketones, which are alternative fuels to glucose. And because of that, um, you can often have more resilience metabolically. So you can reverse some of the stuff that's going towards diabetes or reverse if you're having trouble losing weight and you have leptin resistance. So I'm a huge fan of intermittent fasting. Now the caveats are if you have severe adrenal function dysfunction, hypodrenia or HP axis dysfunction, fasting can be stressful on the adrenals because when you're fasting, you're requiring your liver to release glucose to sustain blood sugar. And if your adrenals aren't working optimally, that may not happen you know, well, so you may be prone to low blood sugars. Um, if you're pregnant, I don't recommend it. Um, if you are um, extremes of age, I don't recommend it. Uh, or if you're just, you know, metabolically, if you're really sick, it can be a little bit of a stressor to the body. Now, stressor isn't bad. That can be good. But some of those extremes, I wouldn't recommend intermittent fasting. Or if you have blood sugar issues. Okay. I think for today, I'm going to wrap this up. I will be back next month. Stay tuned. If you watch the feed, you'll see uh, right now it's every fourth Friday. We'll be back here at 4 p.m. Mountain to answer your questions. So please come back and join us. Thank you all so much today. Um, I hope you have a wonderful weekend and it was great to see you all virtually. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye.